Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Welcome to Layout Building. In this episode, I'm going to finish the track work on our N-Scale Siren Creek project layout. Our N-Scale Siren Creek layout is designed to be small enough that Nicole and I can take it with us when we travel in our RV. It's also a way for me to do some model railroading while I'm waiting for the train room for my future HO scale layout to be completed. In the last episode, I made a temporary bridge to complete the main line. This time I'm going to finish the track work. My plan was to start by gluing down ties for all the remaining track, but I ran out of the Clover House N-Scale PC board tie strips that I've been using. I thought I'd ordered enough, but apparently not. I managed to put down ties for the remainder of the passing siding, the dual gauge wharf spur, the standard gauge freight house track, and part of the narrow gauge yard. I think the reasons that I went through the PC board tie strips so quickly were because I used nothing but PC board ties on the bridge track, and because I've started using mostly PC board ties under all the turnouts. Building turnouts without any kind of template, it's sometimes difficult to know where all the parts are going to end up, and that makes it harder to figure out where the PC board ties are really needed. It's easier to just use PC board ties under the whole thing, and then I know I have plenty of places where I can solder the rails to the ties. I still have plenty of wood ties. Unfortunately, Clover House was out of stock of the PC board tie strips when I went to order more. I'll need to come up with a plan B. I found some different N, NN3, and Z scale PC board ties on the Fast Tracks website. Since I've never used these before, I ordered a few of each type that I thought might be useful. I won't necessarily use all of them. I ordered regular NN3 ties, regular N-scale ties, Z-scale turnout ties, N-scale turnout ties, and N-scale crossover ties. I'll try using these a little later. A Y turnout is one where both paths through the frog diverge instead of having one straight path. Other than that, this turnout is built the same way as the number 6 turnout that forms the other half of the crossover at the west end of the passing siding. If you want to see all the details of how I built the number 6 turnout, please refer back to episode 8 of this series. The main difference with the Y turnout other than the shape is under the table. I'm using Switchmaster switch machines and Digitrax DS64 stationary decoders to throw the switches. Most of the turnouts on the layout have their own connections to the DS64s. Each turnout has its own address that can be thrown using my DCC throttle. Since these two turnouts form a crossover though, they need to operate in sync. The connector track between the turnouts is too short to be useful on its own, so there's no reason to throw one switch and not throw the other at the same time. Instead of connecting the Y turnout switch machine to its own output from the DS64, I tied the machine into the wires for the number 6 turnout switch machine, ensuring that both switch machines will always operate together. Of all the dual gauge turnouts on the layout, this one should be the easiest to build. It's essentially just a normal turnout with an extra rail on one side. As with the other turnouts on the layout, I've started with the outer rails in frog. This is another turnout that's built to fit the situation and not to a specific frog number. The one thing I've done differently is to solder the guardrail for the standard gauge before adding more parts since it's easier to access. The next piece is the narrow gauge stock rail for the straight path. I filed the rail web away where the switch point will make contact. I'll solder it in place. I've bent a couple of pieces of rail that will become the switch points and closure rails. After cutting them apart, I've soldered the bent pieces to complete the frog. As with all my turnouts, I need gaps to make sure that the frog is electrically isolated. I build my turnouts with combined switch points and closure rails. With those installed, along with a PC board tie throw bar and guard rails, this turnout is complete as far as the rails go. Before doing any wiring, I like to use my multimeter to check for electrical shorts. I set it to detect resistance, then use the probes to test the rails. I ended up having to recut a couple of the gaps in the PC board ties to clear a short. Now it's testing good. The last dual gauge turnout to build is for the standard gauge freight house track. As with most of the other turnouts, this one is also being built to fit the space. It occurred to me as I built these turnouts that they all have the same basic parts. The partial dual gauge turnouts just leave out some of those parts. So this turnout has the closure rail that crosses the narrow gauge running rail and all the associated necessary guard rails, but only a single frog. Compare it to the turnout for the engine house track, which has a dual frog, but the closure rail doesn't cross the narrow gauge running rail. I like to test as I go, so now is a good time to see how the new turnouts work. So far, so good. I also want to check the clearances on the passing siding. The inner track is an 11 inch radius and the outer track is 12 and a half. This should be enough separation, but it never hurts to make sure. These full-length passenger cars are a good test since they're among the longest N-scale cars that I have. 
The maximum overhang for a piece of rolling stock is in the middle of the car on the inside of a curve and on the ends of the car on the outside of the curve. This looks good. The minimum clearance between the cars is about a quarter inch. Shorter equipment will overhang less, so I should be able to run just about any in-scale rolling stock on this layout and not have to worry about sideswiping. Before I can complete the dual gauge wharf track, I have to figure out the small trestle over Siren Creek. I've built a temporary support for the bridge ties that's a smaller version of the one I made for the bigger bridge across the harbor entrance, but there's an issue. I wasn't really thinking about the trestle design when I cut the plywood to make room for the creek. After studying some photos, it looks like most of the time the abutments are perpendicular to the rails. I cut the plywood at an angle. If I leave it that way, it will make the construction of the trestle more complicated. Instead of that, I've decided to make a couple of cuts to square off the ends. Because of all the wiring and other stuff under the layout now, I'm going to do this by hand and go slowly rather than use a power tool. In hindsight, it would have been better to plan for this from the beginning, but sometimes it's hard to think of everything. Now I have the ends contoured more to my liking. I've cut some pieces of wood to fill out the area behind the abutments. The bridge abutments probably won't be this deep, but I want to make sure that I have enough material to support whatever cosmetic pieces I add later. I'll glue them in place with some construction adhesive. Because of all the changes, I had to make a new temporary support. I'm using a fiber reinforced cutoff wheel and my motor tool to cut the fast tracks ties from the fret. These ties are pre-gapped, which saves a little work. The ties need to be placed with the gaps facing up. Just like I did with the bigger bridge, I'm using blue tape to temporarily hold the ties. I put down the inner rail first, followed by the narrow gauge running rail. It's easier to do this one before the standard gauge outer rail is installed, since it's easier to access. Eventually, I'll cut the blue tape and remove the support and build a trestle from the top down. That's not generally how they build trestles in the real world, but it works well here. The wharf track is the last of the dual gauge track on this layout. With this installed, all that remains is the narrow gauge yard. I'll need to use the fast tracks ties I bought to complete the rest of the yard. I found that my cutter designed for photo etched parts also works well to remove the ties from the fret. It's a little less messy than using the motor tool, which generates a lot of dust. The ends need a little cleanup with a file. The Fast Tracks NN3 PC board ties are longer than the NN3 wood ties that I got from Clover House and to my eye look better. I don't want to pull up the ties that I've already put down. I think rather than cutting the Fast Tracks ties shorter, I'll cut down some standard gauge wood ties to match and fill in the rest of the track with those. Hopefully when everything is ballasted and the scenery is in place, it will all blend together and it won't look too bad to have two different lengths of narrow gauge ties. I'll use the turnout ties and cut them as needed under the turnouts. I'll still need to cut gaps in these. After all of the dual gauge, constructing these turnouts seems simple. I'll start with the outer rails. Then I'll fit the frog point. Finally, I'll bend the combined closure and point rails. I'll cut the end that will be electrically part of the frog. As with all the other turnouts, the frog needs to be electrically isolated. After installing the points, throw bar, and guard rails, the turnout is complete. I'll also fill in the yard tracks. From here on out, the rest is just repetition. The last piece of rail to be put down is on the narrow gauge wharf track. And that's it. The track on the layout is now essentially complete. It looks like my old Mirror Models repair shop kit will fit perfectly. In episode 9 of this series, I showed how I installed the Switchmaster switch machine for the first turnout. There are now 10 of them under the layout, and some of them are crowded close together, especially in the narrow gauge yard area. Though mostly reliable, I've run into a couple issues with these switch machines. In some cases, I've found it necessary to install stops made from some surplus standoffs, the same ones used to mount the switch machines, but other materials could be substituted. The stop keeps the actuating arm from traveling too far. Some of the switch machines get stuck at the end of their travel and won't come back the other way. Having a stop fixes this. They really only need to go far enough to move the switch points. In other places, the stop prevents the actuating arm from hitting and interfering with one of the other switch machine actuating arms. I had to reposition a couple of the switch machines slightly to get everything to work. A paint pen is useful for marking the switch machines to make it easier to tell which is which. For the most part, the numbers are the same as the DCC switch addresses, except for switch machine number 4, which is tied to number 1. There are a lot more wires under the layout now. Keeping everything color-coded and using cable ties definitely helps. In my experience, new track work, especially hand-laid track, needs a shakedown period. The best way to find any areas that need attention is to run trains. Unfortunately, I still don't have an NN3 locomotive to use to test the narrow gauge track, so I'll need to get back on that project. I can run standard gauge trains, though. If there are any problem spots, often a couple of passes with a file will fix them. 
The hard part is determining where to file. I want to make the track as bulletproof as possible before I start on scenery. Meanwhile, it's time to play with the layout. I'm really happy to be done with the track work on the layout. It took a little while, but I think it was worth it. Now I can move on to other aspects of the layout's construction. Stay tuned and thanks for watching.